to begin the day, I would ask our president, uh, Balash, uh, to president of UKIN, to welcome everybody. Um, very welcome to uh, the Open Fora uh, fourth session uh, discussing Learning Cities. It's an honor for me to greet you wherever you are. Just uh, get engaged with the topic of uh, uh, university lifelong learning and learning cities. I think it's a very interesting and very much challenging topic uh, all around the world, how universities can help uh, to um, um, engage people in learning in different formats uh, in urban environments. And I would like to give back the floor. I think this is very much uh, a good day for you can to get together people around learning, life and learning. Thank you to all and um, I greet everyone. Thank you very much, Balash. And as people know, Balash is also very much involved in a learning city in Page. And uh, he's, I suppose, the exemplifies, I suppose, the way in which the university and the city can work closely together. Now, I'll just uh, pass to my colleague, um, uh, Dennis uh, Barrett, to uh, wake everybody up. Uh, so people in the US especially be, be careful now because you're, you're going to be shaken out of your, your slumber. <laughs> not, not really. This is very gentle, uh, a little bit of a warm up and a welcome. And again, um, from my perspective, um, working in Cork Learning City, it's really great to have such a range of different places in the world to share with in the middle of our morning and uh, to thank those who have got up in the middle of their night to join us. So um, every morning we've done something different just to get to know each other a little bit better. And I think that's been uh, worth the time. The time is tight, but uh, I feel the connections that we make over the course of these days, that's what will stand to us in the future. So every day we've done something a little bit different. So today I'm going to suggest that at the bottom of your screen, if you um, can use this button, just to use this button, uh, you'll see the various options and one is called reactions. So it gives you the option to do a thumbs up or a smiley face or anything you like. So I'm just going to ask you all just to pick whatever you feel like putting up there. There's no right or wrong way of doing it. I'm not expecting you all to be happy. Uh, some of you are very tired, I know that. So just use that and I'm going to skip around the room and just, if you could tell us who you are and which city you're based in. So Seamus, we've heard from, from Cork. I'm also from Cork. Next on my screen is Constantinos. So Constantinos, which city are you from? Hello, hello to everyone. Hello, Balaz. Hello, Siemus. Hello, Denis. Hello to all the colleagues around the world. Good morning and good evening. My name is Konstantinos Pagratis. I'm from Hamburg. I represent UNESCO Institute for Lifelong Learning, uh, which is also based in Hamburg. And I really enjoyed our discussion yesterday. That's why I'm here today, to learn more and to hear the perspective, uh, more particularly from the U.S., and with this, I would like to thank you so much again for organizing this event. Thank you. Thanks, Consinas. So next is one of our speakers today, Don. Don, which part of the world you're sharing the same backdrop, backdrop as uh, Seamus, but you're in a different part of the world. So I'm in a different part of the world. Uh, good morning, everyone from, from Texas. I'm in Austin, Texas, Central Texas. Um, I am with uh, Austin Community College and uh, serve as the Director of Corporate and Community Education for our Continuing Education Division, our Furthering Education uh, area of the college, and I'm looking forward to visiting with you guys this morning. Thanks, Don, and thanks for getting up earliest so far, 4.30 he joined us this morning in his time. Next is Annalisa, which city, Annalisa? And I saw you put up a heart, which was nice of you, because I know you're not a morning person. <laughs> but I'm feeling the love. Um, I'm in Ithaca, New York, which is in the Finger Lakes region, and it's a part of, it's not exactly upstate, but it's not New York City. It's part of rural New York. It's a beautiful part of New York. Thanks, Annalisa. So we have, um, we've had with us all week, again, some dedicated early risers from the states that have joined us each day. So today is an opportunity to hear a little bit more from you. So in the um, responses to the speakers later, I would encourage you to, um, to speak to your own realities in the states. Obviously, there'll be opportunities for other parts of the world to contribute. Next on, our, on my own screen here is Elizabeth. So again, Elizabeth, tell us where you're from. 
from St. Cloud State University in Minnesota, St. Cloud, Minnesota, in the heartland. Brilliant. Thanks, Elizabeth. Uh, next is Ule from a uh, very different part of the world. Hi, hello. Uh, I am from University of Tartu, Estonia, and working as continuing education specialist in, uh, in our lifelong learning center, and also working as uh, secretary general in UKEN. Brilliant. Thanks, Ule. So next is John. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm John, and I'm in uh, Lowell, Massachusetts right now, enjoying the darkness. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to skip past those who you know. So Balash, thanks for your morning welcome um, from Paige. Susan is next on my screen. Good morning, everybody. It's nice to see you again. I live in Palm City in Florida. It's about um, halfway between Orlando and Miami, just near West Palm Beach. And the background behind me is my campus in Jupiter, and I work at Florida Atlantic University. Brilliant. Thanks, Susan. So next is Luca. Again, Luca, you've uh, shared this journey with us all week. Uh, just to remind those who are new where, where you're based. Uh, you're on mute, Luca. Sorry. Oh, sorry, I forgot it, to unmute the mic. So um, I'm Luka Gabaszczyk. I come from Ljubljana, Slovenia, from Sposet International Center for Knowledge Promotion. Thanks, Luka. Next is, um, I think, Jennifer, you haven't uh, joined yet, so just introduce yourself. A good colleague and friend from our part of the world. Good morning, everyone. Um, yeah, Jennifer's my name. I work in ACE with Seamus and in Learning Neighbourhoods with Dennis. So. Um, apologies, I've missed the earlier week session, so looking forward to seeing what's on the agenda today and hopefully catch up with you tomorrow as well. Thanks. Thanks, Jennifer. So, Joni, if you want to give a wave, I think everyone knows Joni at this stage. Uh, Carmel, just to tell people where you're from, Carmel. Hello, good morning. I am from Budapest, from the Doctor School of Education. And my focus is on learning cities and learning communities in my research. Brilliant. And Carmel, for those that weren't able to join, uh, gave a brilliant presentation earlier in the week. And all the presentations are going to be shared, I know, by Karma and her team. So I'm just going to, again, go to those who are uh, not known to you. So Olga, uh, thanks for joining us from, again, a different part of the world. Olga, do you want to tell us where you're based? Mm, yeah. Hi. Sorry. Hi. I'm only one over today. Hello. Uh, Hello. Everybody. Yes, I present a um, small city in Russian Federation, to your site. Name is Almeta. Uh, uh, we have small uh, oil institute, Almeta State Oil Institute, and I work as a specialist of international project department. Brilliant. Thanks, Olga. So we're going far west to far east. Next on my screen is um, Francesca. So Francesca, I think you want to say a quick hello and where you're based. Uh, yes. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Francesca. I am part of UCAN team and therefore based in Barcelona. Hi, Brilliant. everyone. Lovely. And the other UCAN team members are with you. Uh, Karma, if you want to turn on your screen and give a wave, but I think everybody knows who you hello. are. <laughs> hello from Barcelona. Thank you. Uh, so next is Denise Chukup. So Denise, do you want to tell us uh, where you're based? Hello, everybody. Um, I'm based in Overeyes. I work for the European Parliamentary Research Service, and my job is to write uh, briefings for MEPs who normally don't uh, deal with the subject and I write on education, lifelong learning and youth. Brilliant. That's a really interesting job, Denise. You're keen to keep the connections after this. Uh, next on my screen is Hernart. Apologies for if I have pronounced your name wrong. Hernart, do you want to tell us who, who you are and where you're from? Yeah, good morning, panelists. I am Hernat GK Bani from Ghana, West Africa. I am an educationist. 
I mean, to look at the learning platforms that we can use to enhance teaching and learning across the globe. Thank you. Brilliant, lovely. That's great to have. I think that's the first uh, person to join us from Africa during the week. Uh, now I'm going to go to Montse. Montse, do you want to tell us where you're from? Hello, everyone. This is Monse. I'm from Barcelona. I work here in the UK office and I'm a team assistant. So I'm, I, I'm from the, all the, key pro, uh, the team from Barcelona. Sorry. Brilliant. Thanks, Monse. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so, Julie Vitrick. Julie, do you want to tell us again? You're a part of the team, I think. Yes. Hello, everyone. I'm also part of the UK team in Barcelona. Brilliant. Thanks, Julie. Um, so Juan Carlos uh, is next. Juan Carlos again, uh, just to tell Hi. the newcomers where you're based. Yes. Hi, everybody. I'm Juan Carlos. I'm from the uh, University of Madrid, uh, Carlos III in, in Spain. And I'm a team member of UCAN.net. Thank you. Thanks, Juan Carlos. So we have with us today Natalie, and Natalie is a colleague of Mary, who you met yesterday. But Natalie, do you want to introduce yourself and uh, where you're from? Hi, Dennis and everyone. Um, Mary sends her apologies. She's in a, another meeting. We're juggling lots of meetings. I've got another one at 12, unfortunately. But I'm Natalie Lewis, the Learning Regions Coordinator for City of Wolverhampton. And I'm based in University of Wolverhampton, along with Mary in the Centre for Lifelong Learning. So we are part of the core partner group for the Wolverhampton City Learning Region Initiative. Brilliant. Thanks, Natalie. And uh, last but not least, uh, Dr. Dunkel, who was with us earlier in the week. But again, for newcomers, Dr. Dunkel, do you want to tell us where you're based? Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Susan Dunkel. I'm at Damon College in Buffalo, New York. Um, and I am from the US and I am a, a teacher educator. Brilliant. So we will, again, encourage all the, the voices from America uh, to join uh, those who are presenting today. But I will uh, now pass us back to Seamus, who will introduce each of the speakers in turn, and uh, hopefully we'll hear from many of you at the end of the session also. Okay, good morning. Thanks, Dennis. And we're all wide awake. And it's nice that we have people from uh, east and west and north and south and uh, that's a very very good spread of people and that's that's really important that we learn together so this morning the idea was that we would uh, get um, some insights from what's happening in the US uh, and uh, we have people from a, a number of different places and the first person is uh, John um, Wooding uh, who John John spoke earlier from Lowell in Massachusetts and uh, uh, John has been developing the learning city model and I think importantly uh, connecting the university with the project in a very, very real and uh, meaningful way. And he's also been uh, very active in generating the learning city conversation in the US. So John, uh, over to you. Okay, th thank you. Good, good morning, everybody. Um, as some of you may have noticed, I'm, I've got an English accent. I've been living in the United States for the last 40 years or so, I came here to go to graduate school and then ended up staying, didn't mean to. So if you're confused by my background, it's because I'm a Brit in America. Um, so I'm going to um, share a screen in a second here. And can you see that shared screen? Yep. Okay. Good. Okay, hang on. I can't, but now I can. Okay. So um, what I'd like to do very briefly is to tell you a little bit about what we've been doing in Lowell around becoming a learning city. Um, just for the record, I'm an emeritus professor of political science at, at UMass. Uh, I retired a couple of years ago, but got involved in this project about three or four years ago, largely because of meeting all my good friends in Cork, in Ireland, uh, at a conference, and this is how this started. So um, Lowell, uh, it's a city which I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about before I tell you about what we've been doing here in the last couple of years. Uh, it has a slogan, there's a lot to like, which is really kind of a silly slogan, but it's what it's got. And uh, we want to add this, there's a lot to like and learn about Lowell. Um, and Lowell is, um, let me just show you, just in case those of you who don't know, Lowell is in Massachusetts. Uh, it's about 25 miles north 
west of Boston, um, which is a big asset for it because Boston is obviously a major metropolitan area and uh, Massachusetts is the, the last liberal stronghold of the United States at this point. And um, many of you probably have been here, but um, probably not to Lowell. Um, one other thing that Lowell is famous for is that its most famous son is Jack Kerouac, the founder, if you like, of the Beat Generation and great writer. More on him later. Um, I'm going to give you a very brief overview of what Lowell looks like. It's um, considered to be the city where the Industrial Revolution started in the United States. That led to the building of lots and lots of factories. The first factory workers were local mill girls. Then there was a massive Irish immigration, French Canadian immigration, Greeks, Poles, Lithuanians, and more lately in the 1980s, a uh, very large Southeast Asian and Cambodian population. So it's often considered to be both the mill city because of the Industrial Revolution was based on, on factories making textiles, uh, the immigrant city because so many workers came to work in these new factory systems, and uh, more, more recently as a city which is uh, in decline, if you like, and I'll get to that in a second. Um, very briefly, there's some pictures of the city of Lowell. It sits on the Merrimack River, which is a pretty large river um, that runs into the Atlantic. Um, and that river provided the initial source of power for the textile mills and the start of the Industrial Revolution. But like in many other countries, when the mills, um, in the, by the end of the 19th century, the mills were getting unionized because the wages were very low and unionization helped raise wages. But the owners of the mills moved those mills to the south where there were, uh, were no unions, exploited predominantly black labor. Um, and the Lowell economy, especially in the 1930s, begins to shrink. And by the post-war period, it's a post-industrial city with very high levels of unemployment and a declining population. Uh, what it was left with, and you can see in the top right picture, but just one example, it were these canals with these empty factories, uh, which were the mill factories. Uh, partly because of one person's vision um, and a, con a set of circumstances that led to the development of a first national urban park there. And those mills were turned into museums and lofts and buildings. That's interesting for those, perhaps for those of you who think of an American national park as being, um, I don't know, uh, the Grand Canyon or Yosemite. This was the first urban national park run by the federal government. So it's actually a park and the buildings in it are made into a park. And this really helped Lowell revive itself a little bit. And then in the 1980s, there was a massive uh, uh, increase in the number of folks coming from Southeast Asia, particularly refugees from Cambodia, which has really added to the value of the city and the life of the city. Um, but it struggled as a city to rebuild itself. Um, in the early 2000s, we adopted a, pro, uh, a perspective on trying to rebuild the city as an arts and culture city, the so-called creative economy. It sort of worked, um, and, but not entirely. So that's a little bit of that background, um, just to give you a sense of what it looks like. In demographic terms, uh, the city has about 110,000 people in it. Um, the median age is around the 30s. Um, it's not a rich city. As you can see, the poverty rate uh, as of 2000, I think it's figures from 2018, is about 22%. The median household income about forty-seven thousand dollars, and as you can see in America, where the level of um, poverty is set pretty low, you don't become eligible for any kind of support benefits in the federal system if a family of four's income is below is above twenty-five thousand one hundred dollars a year, which is a very small income, especially in the Boston area. So it's still got some of these problems. Okay. One of the things that's wonderful about Lowell is it is be, it's a very immigrant-based and multinational city. Um, the largest individual population other than white, which is declining, is the Asian population, predominantly Cambodian. So this brings a lot of the Cambodian history and culture and food into the city and a lot of um, um, creative ideas. One of the problems, which I talk about in a moment, is the governance of the city sort of lags behind the change in the demographics. The city council, and we have a city council system here, which is elected, um, as only had two minority candidates in the last 10 years, we only have one now. And the school committee, which is very important in the American system, has had no minority members for 60 years. So that's, that's become an issue, which I'll get to in a second in some of the challenges. 
However, we have um, four major learning institutions in the city, the school system, and one of the largest school systems and largest high school with 4,000 students in, in the state of Massachusetts, a very large and effective middle community college where students spend two years to get a degree. The historical park, which I mentioned, which was formed in the, mid, in the late 1970s, brings about half a million visitors to the, to the city every year, including school children and teachers through the park trains in the history of the Industrial Revolution in the United States. And finally, my institution, the University of Massachusetts Lowell's campus, the UMass system has five campuses. It's a full four year research university. Close to 20,000 students now attend the university. Um, not right now, because most of them are online over a thousand staff and over a thousand faculty and it's right downtown so that's a big kind of institution so Lowell itself and our, our work here we always had in the city a lot of a lot of festivals the most famous of which is the folk festival which is a three-day free the largest three-day free open-air festival in the in the country it's a wonderful event it brings about 150,000 people to Lowell but there's also the Irish Cultural Festival, the Southeast Asian Water Festival, which is actually very important. That brings about 40,000 people on a, on a Saturday in August. Um, we have a winter fest, we have an uh, African festival, we have all manner of festivals, in fact, maybe too many. Uh, this project, the Learning City project we developed in Log, actually emerged out of work I did with a bunch of folks around reviving Earth Day and fighting climate change. And here are some pictures of what we did in Lowell when we started reviving Earth Day. This was probably 2016. Um, and the group that formed around the Earth Day celebration became the core group for promoting Lowell as a learning city. We had lots of meetings. And as I say here in this, cut my favorite cartoon, the, the Americans are obsessed with working groups. So we always form them. And they're actually very valuable. But sometimes I do think the revolution is doomed when we do that. Um, one of the individuals involved in bringing the National Park to, uh, to Lowell in the 1980s, 1970s was this uh, educator, he was the headmaster of the high school, Pat Mogan. And I quote him here because it's an interesting term in the sense of we're talking about the work of UNESCO and learning cities. He, he envisioned Lowell as an educative city or a classroom without walls. And so this, this notion that, that's taken much further, of course, in the work you all do was beginning to be developed in law in the 1970s, even though nobody really recognized that in those terms. And this moving forward was hampered by the economic decline in the city. This is a picture of Pat Mogan. He, um, he's, he's dead now, but he, as I said, he played a, a leading role in bringing the park to the city and the park is a learning institution. Um, this slide just shows you the core of the group of the institutions which we've been working with over the last two or three years to try and develop a learning city here. The city of Lowell itself, the National Park, the large community college, the university, and the Lowell High School system in particular, its school system, and that's at the core. But around that, and one of the things that um, we can talk about perhaps more tomorrow is that one aspect of living in the United States, which is perhaps different from most of Europe, is a lot of the work that um, government does in Europe is not done by governments in the United States. A lot of the work at the community level is done by um, what we call not-for-profit organizations or non-governmental organizations, of which Lowell has many. And here are just, these are just the, the signs of some of them uh, that we are working with now in the Learning Cities uh, program. And th there's a very large amount of what we would call social capital in Lowell sometimes by necessity because government is relatively weak in the United States and doesn't provide the kind of social services um, that you would expect. So we have this very rich um, learning and social service and social equity, uh, not-for-profit kind of activity. Um, what we've done in the last three years, and it's been a struggle, um, we have these uh, key organizations, the Lowell Plan, which is an economic development organization, the Cultural Organization of Lowell, which brings together all the arts and cultural activities of the, of the city, and which I used to be chair of, the, of, of, of that organization, whose acronym is COOL, so I could always sit in offices and say, I'm the chair of COOL, which I really like doing. Um, we also have Project Learn, which is an effort to bring arts and music back into the school system because that was cut because of budget problems, right? Those of you in Europe who don't know this, um, 
schools are locally funded in, mostly by real estate taxes of, this, of the location in which they're in, which to my mind is utterly crazy because all the poor neighborhoods have little funding and little taxes and therefore very poor under-resourced under schools. The other, things, the other group we've been working with and make up a partnership around the City of Learning idea um, are the education institutions other than the school and the university. Uh, there's a bunch of these here, including the public schools, the local library. We've been working with a couple of youth organizations, the United Teen Equity Center or UTEC, the YMCA, the Boys and Girls Club. These are all very vibrant organizations we have on our, on our group, environmental organizations, the Sierra Club of Lowell, Climate Action Change, um, Mill City Grows is a very, very powerful organization involved in growing local and community-based uh, organic vegetables um, and training and teaching people about gardening. There's a lot of ethnic groups in Lowell, obviously, because it's immigration background, and we work very closely with the Cambodian Mutual Aid Association, the, the African Community Center, and the Greek Heritage Association. There's a whole bunch of other not-for-profits uh, that are, we are involved with and part of our group. Um, and we also build on these festivals that we have every year, which I mentioned earlier. Um, and we do also work as much as possible with the creative uh, organizations, arts and uh, culture, uh, particularly Western Avenue Studios. It, it, Noel has um, the largest number of resident artists this side of the Mississippi, which is partly that creative economy development program. And part of it was to try to say, well, you bring artists to a, a, to a city, uh, the city will develop. Uh, the, the problem with that is that artists are great, but they don't have any money. So it's gone, they don't spend money on stuff. All right, very quickly, um, this year because of COVID, um, we did our, I think our second full attempt at a, at a, at a festival of learning. And we did that um, virtually. And these are just like some examples of the things we put on, a couple of things every, every day during the week. At the same time, which, uh, which Cork did their Festival of Learning, and we did a lot of, we have worked very deeply with Cork and, and been a great, a great asset for us to work together. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Um, so what have we done so far? Um, we started this uh, about in 2017. I think it sort of goes from when I, I first met Dennis and Shian and, and Cork, and Cork was awarded the um, UNESCO Learning City of the Year and they had their big uh, biannual conference in Cork and I met some wonderful people and met the folks in Cork and was encouraged to try and work with my partners here to try and develop um, Lowell into a city of learning or a learning city. So when I came back after the visit in Cork, we began to mobilize organizations which had been part of the Earth Day events that we'd done and those 40 odd organizations make up our partnership committee. Our image of this was to create an umbrella engaging all of the organizations in law rather than make ourselves into a new organization. But that had problems and will have problems because we can't get funding because we don't really have an organization. We just have a bunch of volunteers hanging out together. Um, we've been trying to, to develop a theme uh, about learning every month based on the festivals, the many festivals that Lowell has. We've, we've done that a little bit. Um, this October is key to the Kerouac Festival. There's an annual uh, um, celebration of Jack, Jack Kerouac in Lowell. Um, and we sort of think about writing and poetry, obviously, because he was a famous writer. Um, we've been thinking about how we might spread out the Festival of Learning's idea, and that's something I'd love to talk about. Um, we've had two Festivals of Learning so far, um, and they've been, it's a beginning, it's a beginning. Um, we did also try and get together a sort of program or collate all the learning opportunities in Lowell. Um, one thing we did during that process was publish the book Atlantic Currents. I'll, I'll show that in a moment. And we're also developing the brand of Lowell as a learning city. Um, this, this book, which came out this year, right in the middle of the pandemic, um, which involved my friend and editor Paul Marion and my friend Tina Nealon in, in, uh, in Cork and myself, we, we gathered together as much writing and poetry from Cork and Lowell's communities of people related to those cities, and we published it as, a, as an anthology. And I'm very proud of this. It's, it's, it's an expression of the talents in these two cities. It ties two learning cities together, and it's just been a wonderful experience. Unfortunately, we published it in the middle of the, of the pandemic, and so it was harder to develop and publish it. Um, so our goals going forward, um, and one problem we really have, of course, is that the, the United States is no longer in UNESCO. 
so we can't become a learning city. Um, so that, that happened in, in 2019. Uh, it was a major blow to what we're trying to do. We try and, however, to continue to build and frame a learning city and city of learning in Lowell. Uh, we're leveraging the things I've talked about. Uh, we continue to develop the learning festival. And we are building as many connections between sustainable development goals and learning as we can. Lastly, just a couple of slides here. The assets in Lowell and the assets for becoming a learning city uh, is primarily, from my mind, the wonderfully large and diverse community we have, the huge amount of social capital that exists in Lowell, largely because it has to, because it has to make up for the lack of government and other kind of funding. The fact that we have a major research university downtown, but as we spoke about yesterday, that's a great asset, but the university is still too, in my mind, isolated from the community and the degree do which we in fact all the other things which universities have to look at. I think primarily is the reward and merit system for faculty because working with the community is not rewarded in most universities in the United States for tenure and promotion. And so that's a whole issue we could discuss. The, the, the historical park is really an enormous asset. They have their own buildings, they bring people to the, to the city, they remind people of the past, they educate. We have a very thriving arts community and we are very close to Boston, which is a really, really big plus for a, a city like Lowell. But we have some problems. It's a poor city, there's no money. Um, um, and it's gonna get much worse after the pandemic and make our lives, I think, much more difficult. It has, as I mentioned, an unrepresentative and very conservative city council who endorsed the idea of Lowell becoming a learning city, but provided no support and um, no money. Um, and that's an issue which I can also talk about more. Uh, it, the city tends to rely on the past glories of its history as the first industrial city, the first in the place of the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. The degree to which students and universities engage with the local community, as I said, is still problematic. It's still something we're working on. Um, and lastly, I think that the last two things is there are, there are very, very many wonderful organizations in law, but we all compete for funds from a sim, uh, one pool, and that's a problem. And why I resisted making um, our own learning city initiative um, not into a not-for-profit because I didn't want to compete with those folks. And I think and sometimes there's a lack of vision among city leaders. And my last slide, uh, we face challenges because of UN membership, getting financial support, getting students and faculty involved, maintaining our committee, which is basically six volunteers now. We've been working for three years to do this. Uh, not competing, as I said, for the money for not profits, and finding, lastly, some kind of physical space and entity downtown. Thank you all very much. I hope that was helpful. You're muted there, Seamus. Thank you, John. That was really, really impressive. Um, and uh, it, sometimes it's good to just um, present these things to realize how far you've come. In that period of time. You know, I mean, it is, uh, I was, I was uh, extremely impressed uh, by the range of actors you've engaged, uh, ideas, the dynamism of the whole project. And I think it's, it's, it's fantastic. I, I'm, I'm, I'm really impressed, John, and I'm, I'm glad that, uh, we had the opportunity to see what, what you're doing and what you continue to do uh, in Lowell. Um, and sometimes it's the case that maybe uh, profit is not uh, recognized in their own town, but uh, <laughs> we can recognize the profit uh, more more widely. So absolutely well done. And we'll have a chance, I, I hope, to, to come back and, and, and chat about some of these initiatives uh, at the end. Uh, but time, as, as every day we've discovered, is... <laughs> Tempest Fugit, but in this case, I think it's it's, it's going at a uh, sonic uh, speed. So um, we, without further ado, we, we move on to Annalisa. Annalisa is a very good colleague of ours and a very good colleague of UCAN as well. Um, she's been involved in a lot of uh, UCAN events uh, down the years, and uh, she's based in Cornell. And um, I think uh, has been involved in so many different projects uh, across the Atlantic now that she, uh, I'm not sure uh, which side of the Atlantic uh, she, she really is, but anyway, she's still in Ithaca. And uh, I'll just pass you on to Annalisa to uh, pick up her story. Thank you, Seamus. And thank you, Joni, for doing the slides for me. Uh, my computer's overheating, so I put my headphones in. Can everybody hear me? 
Okay, great, thank you. All right, so I'm taking a different um, approach than John did. I'm talking more uh, about a corollary to Dennis's work with the Coalition of the Willing. I'm kind of like working where you can make the space to do so. So I'm calling this planting seeds for the wider learning cities movement in interstitial spaces. And just uh, where I'm located is at, at Cornell. I'm a senior lecturer in the Department of Global Development. Next, Joni. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about my background, about um, how I'm situated in the university, how I became interested in learning cities, how I got started uh, once I came back fired up, and then realizing the need to work interstitially and seeing the pandemic as opportunity and going forward a bit. Next, Joni. So this slide, you, you can't read it all, but I need to tell you just a bit about, I need to uh, tell you a bit about my background so that the irony that comes later <laughs> makes sense. So the top row is basically what I was up to before as a person in my late 40s, I went back to school to get a PhD. So um, the blue things, I, I characterize this period of my life as being a community-based practitioner working in community education, leadership capacity building, and regional policy for the Appalachian region. Um, and the blue ones were things where I was based at a university, but I was still doing basically community practice. And the yellow ones that at the top, those are when I was in local or state government. And then the other, the orangey one is a direct service uh, where I was teaching preschool and kindergarten. And then the green one was a membership organization where I was doing community organizing. So in all of this stuff, I have like a, a learning and education writ large part up until about the Appalachian Center Bria College. And from there on, I'm doing more leadership development policy and that kind of stuff. Well, I decided to go back to school because sustainability was not coming up from the grassroots. And as somebody who had been used to like mobilizing and facilitating other people's stuff, I thought, if it's not coming up from the membership, do I stick it on the agenda? What, you know, how does this work? So I decided to go back to school um, at Cornell and get a degree. At first I got a, a second master's in rural and community development and then I stuck around and did a PhD to amuse myself. So the second row or the bottom half, this is stuff that I've been uh, engaged in primarily in engaged teaching, learning and research based in institutions of higher ed. So I've done pedagogy of place kind of stuff. I've done placemaking and participatory evaluation as um, action research on placemaking, um, civic engagement, developing a lot of curriculum and starting new programs. So I tend to be somebody who either starts things, implements things, or revives things. So my background comes basically as a community organizer working in Appalachia, then teaching in the region and teaching at Cornell and teaching in Alaska, but always with these close ties to like the Highlander Center and taking because, as we know, lifelong learning and community development are very intertwined. <laughs> so that's my background. Next, Joni. So I was recruited back to Cornell to take a job in engaged uh, scholarship, doing evaluation for engaged scholarship projects. And and that was fine, but I the opportunity came up to revive uh, this community learning and service partnership program and that's an adult learning program and so I kind of jumped at the fact jumped at the opportunity and didn't quite have the full picture next slide so class the community learning and service partnership is a situation where students take classes with me in adult and lifelong learning and then they are paired with Cornell employees for whom some of the um, HR professional development offerings are not a great fit. So we're, we range from literacy and basic adult ed to being study buddies for employees who are going back to school and working on degrees. So the idea is that 
Okay. Uh, so the idea is that students have an opportunity to get acquainted with someone and become friends and professional colleagues with someone in a different work of life so that when they are out in the world and decision makers, um, they're, it, their thinking is informed by that experience and uh, employees have a chance to influence a young people, a young person into develop their own skills and interests. So the employee sets the learning agenda and the student is there to mentor them. Next, please. So just to tell you a little bit about that, it began as a social justice minded reciprocal education program back in the late 80s and 90s and it was started in close development with the local UAW United Auto Workers chapter, which for who knows what reason is the union of the service and workers at Cornell. Um, the Cornell in its wisdom closed the education department in 09. I wasn't here at the time and um, it had to do with the economic downturn, but that wasn't it, but I don't know the full story. And so class pit actually come to a complete standstill before I took on the director role. Next slide. And so my task here was to reestablish and uh, revive it. And it turned out the classes weren't even meeting at, lo lo at legal times and they weren't meeting any um, distribution requirements or anything for graduation. So it had declined a bit since uh, the demise of the education department. Um, and next slide, please. And you can just flip through the next two, Joni. These are just you know, like, it's a good lovey-dovey, very photogenic, but very transformative learning experience for all parties involved. So the next slide, so that's kind of what the adults are getting out of it. For the students, it's not a volunteer gig they do take these courses so i offer one in design and facilitation of learning for development and offer an intro class to learning adult learning adult and lifelong learning next slide my colleague off, offers a class in teaching english because many of our service workers kind of like john was describing um, we have a very multicultural multi um, nation immigration kind of population in this area and many of the people that we work with are from elsewhere and want to help some help learning english okay so how i got interested in learning cities well enough time has passed since the demise of the education department that students think they, they, they kind of have an idea <laughs> what education is but they equate it with schooling right Seamus um, so I have to really work to create this space and awareness that hey there's this thing called lifelong learning and so I'm always looking around to try to show them this is not a hallucination of an old hippie this is a real thing and so when I was noodling around I came across the Institute for lifelong learning at UNESCO, which I had not heard of. I came across the Global Network of Learning Cities and that there was this biennial conference and that there was one coming up in Cork Island. And I applied to come and was accepted and went. And as you all have heard, the Cork conference was absolutely wonderful. So I came back all fired up, having met De Dennis and Seamus and other wonderful people there. Next slide, please. Yeah, this is it. No, I'm sorry, back one, thank you. Came back all fired up, wanting to engage students in lifelong learning off campus because our primary, um, you know, the population we work with are the Cornell employees, so I wanted to get them out in the community more. Wanted to connect with learning cities around the world and promote membership into <laughs> UNESCO's global network. This was technically before we had <clears throat> left UNESCO, so I was like trying to cram something in here and focus on the, the SDGs and link students and adult learners with others who are working on local solutions to global problems because our employees are actually quite interested in um, sustainability. So sort of charged out of the gate, began learning, laying groundwork with potential partners, convened educators in the community, educators on campus, um, started looking at where Cornell already had working relationships with communities to see 
can we have a conversation? Does this idea appeal to you? Does it build on what you're already doing? Uh, those kinds of things. And then started networking with these different local institutions, groups, cultural centers around here. Next slide, please. And I thought you, for many cities, the learning festival is the way to begin. Well, this design challenge to create adult career pathways came out. And I thought this is a great thing. This is a wonderful thing because it's for people who don't have any kind of third level degree or credential. It's a way to move them into um, a productive work life. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and we went for it. Next slide, please. It was a great triumph of mobilization in less than two weeks because I found out about it late, right? Um, we had over 40 community members representing over two dozen different groups around these kinds of uh, stakeholder and we as well as churches and unions and things like that and we were well into our uh, big thinking and brainstorming and how we're going to connect the library and how all this is going to work to have this great ecosystem for people to get th education and into jobs and all that and then, and then we put a break on it when we were approached by a community center that serves um, mostly immigrant populations in our city said hey wait a minute no 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 we're going for that same money so that was kind of like oh i know we're working on a fast track here just two weeks but we we had we have somebody from your community at our table <laughs> and how come <laughs> so anyway so who knows what was going on there but we stopped and said no please you go ahead you you submit so Next slide, please. That was great. And it made me fired up to see, oh yes, this is gonna be possible. We can do a learning city here. But then I got called in nicely, but I found out, and here's what I didn't realize when I took this job, that, because, that my position is funded out of the employee benefit pool. And that means there are federal restrictions on what I can do with my time. And there has to be justification to show the direct benefit for Cornell employees. Well, I think a learning city would definitely benefit Cornell employees. But at the time, um, I was told, mm, convening the community partners, no, nope, you can't do that. Which, I mean, if I had known that, I wouldn't have taken the job, right? Because community is all what I'm about. So I'm caught in this creative tension between my department, global development, which wants me to do research and publish and develop courses for the new major, because global development is a new department. Um, and to you know be useful as an academic citizen and then the federal restrictions on the source of my funding which comes through human resources and like I said it's this employee benefit pool next slide please so it wasn't that I waited until the pandemic I had already been you know like going to conferences giving papers doing some talking with people about who can take the lead if I can't. Um, but the pandemic hit and the distinction between campus and community has really diminished as everybody is online, right? So opportunities to connect students with leaders of learning cities and thank you, Balash, and thank you, Seamus, and thank you, Dennis, for coming to my class. And looking ahead, I'm going to, I'm working on how do we connect the adult learners then with um, participants in learning cities around the world been able to actively contribute to advancing emerging networks, uh, the North American Alliance of Learning Cities, right? Uh, John, and thank you, John, for coming to class too, is meeting for the second time next week. Also been able to take play, part in networks, Pascal networks for learning cities and different things, using conferences as an opportunity to learn and network and offer papers, provide workshops. And I think the way to go with my department is, um, I, I think what will really appeal to them is the sustainability aspects. So the course that I've been piloting um, Lifelong learning and sustainability, and as you can see there in the text with a big emphasis on learning ecosystems and learning cities. That I could have already 
submitted to become a regular course, but I'm actually shopping it around in my department to build up better integration of what's left of the education department, which is now an education minor, into the new global development part, uh, global development department. So I haven't converted it yet because I'm kind of using it as a look what this the asset is for the new major because right now um, I need to get my courses integrated into counting towards somebody's degree. They do count toward graduation, but they are not part of a major yet. Next slide. So thinking about going forward, a couple of things I'm doing. One is I'm reaching out through the Cornell Network of International Education to work with the Associate Dean for Global Outreach um, to say, shouldn't Cornell join you can, you know, and different things to make this more real um, back at my university. Um, also to frame my rich background as a community development person and an academic as a big asset for the department and to build allies to say, hey, you know, like given the nature of this position, the college really ought to be paying for part of it. And that means that some of my time would not have those restrictions on what I can and can't do in communities. Um, so I'm tactically serving on key committees that we, that have to do with curriculum, particularly in developing community engaged courses, again, to uh, strengthen my network and ties and relationships, both in the department and in the college. I'm floating the idea of a book proposal because in framing this course, I've really had to think through, okay, how is lifelong learning, the, the kind of the pieces that I've identified is that lifelong learning uh, connects to placemaking, which connects to community development, which connects to thinking about just sustainability so that it's not green, uh, washed green, greening for rich people, but just sustainability. And, and then how does that work with uh, social learning, learning not just for individuals, but collectively for this achieving sustainability. So I would like to put out a call or to see with other people if that's a great good idea for developing a book around that making those links and then to have some accompany, accompanying open source content on the web that could be available for anybody and I also you know because I've got this full time job as a lecturer and this full time job as the director of a class I want to cut back on work so I can have some personal time so I can work locally in the community on my own time last slide I think so my attitude is sort of keep your eyes on the prize, work with the willing, as Dennis says, and just figure out how to, how to keep making things happen and still respect sort of the parameters of the funding that, uh, I, that creates my position. No hay cambio sin sueño, como no hay sueño sin esperanza. There's no change without dreaming. There's no dreaming without hope. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Annalisa. And thank you for ending on that inspiring note. Um, I think um, that message uh, probably has more resonance now than any time. Um, uh, I'm just very, very conscious of time. So I'll pass on directly to Don so that we can, we can get uh, Don before we hit the the magical hour. So Don, over to you. And um, you also got the prize for the earliest riser this morning. So, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're onto a good thing here. Yeah, thanks. Uh, well, I appreciate the opportunity to visit with everyone this morning. Um, I, I want to give you just a little bit of background on Austin Community College and our journey to creating a, a, a pretty robust community education program. Uh, here in Central Texas. Uh, Austin Community College is one of the larger community college systems in the country. We serve about 80,000 students a year uh, through uh, the college and we serve an area that's about 7,000 square miles. And we have a population uh, that we serve of about 2 million people. So it's a, it's a fairly large area and a fairly large college. It's, it's very traditional. Um, we have over a hundred different uh, programs on our credit programs leading to uh, two-year degrees. Um, 
and our population is, our student population is very traditional in nature. Um, and so that's a, sort of the backdrop there. Uh, my area of the college, the continuing education area of the college, is where we provide lots of different kinds of, of programs that uh, pre predominantly serve the non-traditional student population. So they're not 18 to 24. Our average age is 36. Um, they're not necessarily interested in pursuing degrees. They're interested in pursuing um, uh, certifications that have marketplace value and help them um, move into the workplace or to grow in the workplace. And uh, so as we were, uh, a few years ago, as we were thinking about the students that we were reaching, um, even though we, we have programs that serve non-traditional students, we, we really were not reaching the students that we felt like we could. Um, because we still had a traditional model for developing and delivering those uh, those programs. And so we started what we call our Community Pathways program about three years ago. And our, our great learning um, in this process has been that the path uh, to college doesn't start at our door. It, it, it goes without saying, it starts where our students are. And so we, we wanted to identify ways to better reach those who were not walking in our front door and didn't recognize Austin Community College, which is this great resource, but did not recognize it as a resource for them. And, and keep in mind, we, we are a, a minority majority um, community now here in Central Texas. In fact, in our local school district, over 60% of the students are uh, Latinx. It, the demographics here in Central Texas are changing very rapidly. And so the need to connect with uh, students, prospective students in different ways has increased significantly. And it's also critical for us, and we've recognized the importance of, of connecting in a different way to help support community and economic development efforts here in Central Texas. And so, uh, we started our Community Pathways program with the idea of connecting with nonprofit organizations, community-based organizations, and faith-based organizations. And our, our rationale for doing that um, was to create, uh, first and foremost, safe spaces where people felt comfortable. Uh, these were familiar environments. And to identify ways to bring what we do to where they are and at times it makes sense for them. I mean, we literally teach welding in a parking lot in the middle of the night. Um, we literally teach at some of our business partners at three o'clock in the morning. Um, we do lots of work in the middle of the night and on the weekends, and we have uh, been able to identify ways to make what we do very mobile. So we're, we're, we're very flexible and very mobile and able to go out and, and meet individuals where they are out in the communities. We, a good example of something that's happened recently, um, because of COVID, um, our school districts around uh, Central Texas, many of them have shut down and gone to uh, 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 teaching online. Well, many of our underserved populations, our most vulnerable, pop vulnerable populations, don't have access to technology. And even if they do have access to internet and a computer, they don't necessarily know how to use those tools uh, to learn. And so in partnership with uh, Austin School District, um, we have just over the last month trained about 250 parents um, on the technologies that the schools are using so that they can better support their kids uh, during the school term while we're learning at a distance. Um, I think the most important thing that we've learned out of the work so far is that we must put ourselves in the shoes of those we endeavor to serve. We must build a much more empathetic organization than the traditional college model. One that, one that understands and situates where individuals are and, and build solutions for them from where they are to where they want to be. It's not about us helping them achieve our goals. It's about us helping them achieve their goals. Uh, relative to um, 
learning city, I want to give you a sense, and I'm going to kind of go through this, this fairly quickly uh, because I know, I know we're sort of short on time, um, but to give you a sense of where we're going uh, with this idea of creating a, a learning city model here in Central Texas, I, I, you know, several people on the call have mentioned uh, well, I met with uh, Seamus, I met with Dennis, and, and gosh, I'm fired up, right? <laughs> well, yes, a couple, I guess it was um, uh, fall last year, I met with, with Seamus at the American Association of Adult and Continuing Education um, uh, conference in, uh, it was in St. Louis, I guess. And, and we started talking about um, the, the Learning Cities model, and by golly, that's exactly the direction that we want to go with our Community Pathways program. We started with, with two goals in mind with the Learning Pathways program. One was, can we, can we build a model that is sustainable, that enables us to actually go and reach people where they are and deliver the kinds of training that they're interested in um, at whatever time, in whatever location, uh, that works best for them. Let's meet them where they are. That was goal number one. Well, over the last couple of years, we have in, we have engaged over 3,000 students in classes like um, English as a Second Language, Basic Computer Skills, Skilled Trades, Welding, um, Air Conditioning, and um, other uh, other types of, of programs. So we were successful in goal number one. Goal number two was let's figure out, and I didn't know at the time when we started this, I didn't know about learning cities uh, and that model. I, I, our goal was to create a virtuous learning cycle around the community-based organization, nonprofit organization partners we were identifying in these various areas around Central Texas. How do we do that? How do we, how do we step out of the role of organizing and into the role of facilitating the learning. We would not necessarily always be the, the, the education and training provider for programs, but how could we build a network of nonprofits, a network of businesses, a network of other service organizations around our partners out in the community and create a, a, a learning community? And that, that, was, that was the goal. And so what are we doing now? Uh, here in the United States, we have uh, federal planning uh, regions in the different states. Here in Texas, we have 24 of those regions. Our region in Central Texas is called the Capital Area um, Council of Governments. And so it is a collection of county and city um, uh, governments that come together and develop plans for how to administer very various types of, of federal programs. Well, one of the uh, one of the committees um, that is a part of the Council of Government organization is, an, is a regional economic development planning organization. And so it's 10 counties. It's roughly the same 7,000 square miles, over 2 million people in that area. This uh, uh, economic development organization every five years puts together an, a, a comprehensive economic development strategy. Well, I happen to be on that committee. And so that strategy that we're, we're developing this year has four themes, workforce development, entrepreneurship, it has uh, infrastructure, and it has resilience. And so what we've been able to do is weave into that comprehensive economic development strategy themes around lifelong learning, formal, the importance of formal and informal learning opportunity to uh, developing communities and building resilience and promoting economic development. And so step one was to, to figure out how to weave into the, into the conversation regionally, um, developing a lifelong learning culture here in Central Texas. The, the, the next part of, of our work uh, is to begin doing an appreciative inquiry in each of the communities around Central Texas and, and developing a, a cataloging learning assets in the community, the different groups that are doing different things. Much as, as John had mentioned, you know, we have a, a, a very vibrant network of nonprofit and community-based non-governmental organizations here in Central Texas. There are, there are literally 6,000 of them here. Now, some of them are very small and some of them are very large and they're all differently funded and have different missions. But one of the things that we want to do is to catalog and organize that and, and direct that toward uh, broadly uh, learning. And 
uh, we, we've decided in the last couple of days that, that once we do that piece, then we're going to work with each of the communities here in Central Texas to develop what we're going to call a learn local campaign. Um, here in, in uh, the United States, and I, I'm sure this happens in communities all over the world, there's, there, there are uh, efforts to encourage people to buy local, to buy from your local stores, to buy from your local restaurant, you know, uh, uh, local uh, shops and all of these things. Well, building on that same idea, we want to build, we want to create a learn local campaign. And through this learn local campaign, we can, we can begin to step ACC, we can begin to step back out of this organizer role and back into a facilitator role uh, to promote this. And so um, we've, we've really learned a lot over the last few years about overcoming ourselves and what we think people ought to do and how they ought to do it. Um, we've, we've learned to connect with them where they are. We've learned to listen twice as much as we talk. Um, and that's put us in a, in a good place to be able to continue this work forward. From a college perspective, um, coming in this next year, we're going to be taking over uh, one of our 11 campuses, uh, a building on one of our 11 campuses here in Central Texas. And our goal is to uh, very deliberately, and this is not normal, right? Our, uh, uh, I think it was John that had mentioned uh, that the, the school isn't necessarily, and the students are not necessarily connected to the local community. Well, we're going to, we're going to take this building uh, that we're being allocated at one of our campuses and very deliberately build a model for connecting and collaborating with that hyper-local community within, uh, you know, a certain number of miles around it so that it becomes a, a living, vibrant part of that community, and it becomes an asset that people recognize. Um, even though they may not be traditional students, they recognize the college as an asset. So that's a little bit of the big picture uh, here. We've, we've been doing this work for a few years. We now have made some steps toward creating a, a, a more formal learning community uh, across Central Texas um, through this uh, uh, regional economic development plan and, and threading lifelong learning through that. And we're about to take, take over a, a building on one of our campuses and turn that into really a center of the, uh, of the community. So that's the big picture on what we're doing here in, in, in Central Texas. Thanks very much, Don. Uh, that was, uh, we had real, three really, really informative and uh, diverse uh, presentations. It was just uh, so good and so enriching. Uh, it's it's terrible we've <laughs> run over time and we realized a lot of people had to leave because you know the, the nature of the world is that there are other meetings and so on and so forth but we got a lot of very very positive feedback in the chat and uh, so on I, I'm just conscious it's 10 past already uh, we have to we have tomorrow an opportunity I think to go into a lot of uh, the discussion around these again but uh, maybe if if we could take maybe a question <laughs> from one person maybe and it might be quicker if if, if they did it uh, live so if somebody maybe wanted to ask one quick question we'll just run quickly back through the three speakers and then wrap up because I, i'm very conscious we are well over time any brave soul want to ask uh, the, the one question I just throw one in, uh, which is something I've been thinking about from each of the presentations. It's the importance of networks. I think each of you in different ways um, referenced it, John, in terms of the network that you've connected with, using learning as a connector. Uh, Annalisa, the networks that you have consistently reached out to, and also the struggles within your own institution. And then Don, uh, again, very much uh, a, um, a part of your strategy. So just a reflection on the importance of of networks, how to build them, how to sustain them um, from any of you. Yeah, good question, Dennis. Yeah, and that certainly rang through all of them. So, John, do you want, do you want to, since you were the first off? Yeah, I take a good shot. I mean, you, you got not much time. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously, you, you guys, Seamus and Dennis and the folks in Cork are part of the network that we've developed, and I think we would have got to know in Annalisa, and we're now developing a North American network of potential learning cities. Um, and that's great. I think one of the challenges for us has been 
how do we develop a regional network, we, which we haven't explored very much because we've not been in touch with other cities and towns, even in Massachusetts or New England. But hearing Don, um, I just sent him a note. I really want to connect with Don, and he's working on the same kind of stuff, and I think has the same beliefs about the world that I do, and I, it would be great to do that. So this is this is a good part of it, and, and actually, perversely, Zoom makes it easier, and the, and the pandemic makes it easier in that way. So that's my two cents, quickly. Thank you very much, John. And Lisa? Uh, I just enjoyed hearing the different things and meeting Don, and I appreciate um, that the rest of you, not in the US, has been so welcoming to us, and I really appreciate the leadership and stewardship that you all have continued to shepherd those of us who are interested, and I'm excited to meet other people in the US that are interested too. Thank you. Thanks very much, Annalisa. Don? Um, John, yes, absolutely. Let's, um, let's connect around um, the, the strength of the Council of Governments as an organizing entity. Uh, and, and you've got a Council of Governments area just up there. Um, I've appreciated the opportunity to connect with all of you uh, from around the world and learn from all of you from around the world. I think the, the strength of the Learning Cities Network is, is being able to share best practice. Um, and, I, and, and there's been a great deal of learning uh, just in the, in the short period of time that I've been able to participate in the conversations with you all and uh, with Seamus and Dennis and Jennifer and the team in and, and Cork. Um, it, it's been uh, a great inspiration for us in moving our efforts forward and we're making progress. And even though we're not part of uh, UNESCO uh, and that sort of thing, we can, we can draw on the lessons from some of the other learning cities from around the world and apply those things here and then share those things out. There, 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 there are great learnings to be had, whether we're officially a learning city under the UNESCO flag or whether we, we do it in our own way and model it after that. And so I'm, I'm looking forward to continuing the conversation with all of you from around the world. Thank you, Don. And thank you, John and Lisa and Don. Uh, this was a very, very inspiring morning uh, for us. Uh, we learned a lot. I learned a lot uh, from listening to all three of you. And, uh, you know, we really appreciate you getting up at uh, crazy hours <laughs> of the morning to uh, be with us <laughs> and to share with us. Uh, uh, that was a big sacrifice, uh, I know. Uh, and uh, it's a busy time and there's a lot of other stuff going on in the US, I believe, at the moment. Uh, so it's, uh, it's, it's just one of those times. So thank, thank you very much. I'm, it's a real p pity we don't have a little bit more time. Uh, but tomorrow, hopefully, we'll, we'll get a chance to come back and, and chat to uh, chat through so all of these again. And uh, uh, I don't know, Balash, on behalf of uh, you, can if you want to say some final words before we shut the meeting down? Um, I think you, you just said everything that uh, needs to be emphasized. I think it is a very important matter. And I think uh, we could learn again a lot and collect and share some good knowledge across uh, good practices and important uh, messages uh, highlighted. Thank you very much, Annalisa, Don and John, uh, for those inputs. Uh, I think uh, it's very much important for universities to learn what are the realities around learning city improvements in local and regional environments. And I hope we can also share some uh, um, uh, necessary documentation to follow the, to help understanding the environment for this. So, if we may ask uh, uh, the group to uh, collect some further uh, inputs, not only for the presentations, uh, if there are, but also if there are available documentation on the development or uh, photographs or films, uh, which might uh, help us to understand more about the community development. So thank you very much again for this. Uh, thank you. Dennis and uh, Seamus for, for all these things uh, around. Thank you very much colleagues uh, at UCAN office uh, for providing the technical background and uh, let us meet tomorrow at 12 o'clock for uh, the uh, open fora uh, session to discuss further on uh, and come to some conclusions. Thank you for now. Thank you. Thanks.